Bloodborne is a horrifically beautiful game in every way imaginable. It's one of the most strikingly stylish and unforgettable experiences that have possibly ever been made. In a lot of ways, it's a horror game disguised as an action game, but what's truly amazing about it is despite a lot of the limitations from the technical side of things, you know, its age and some of its less than great mechanics, Bloodborne is many people's favorite title in FromSoft's entire catalog, and it's definitely one of my favorites as well. Bloodborne excels at so many different things, you know, purely from an atmosphere and visual perspective, it's completely immaculate. That plus the gameplay, combat, level design, progression systems, and bosses are where the true magic of Bloodborne really are in my opinion. There's a certain attention to detail that often goes unrecognized in FromSoft games, but if you got your eyes open enough, or you've got enough insight, you'll start to see where some deliberate choices were made that make the game so special. Not only, you know, compared to other video games in general, but like I said, even being a standout gem in FromSoft's long catalog. The game was released in 2015 for PlayStation 4 and quickly became one of the most beloved and talked about video games, subsequently winning Game of the Year as well. It's kind of strange to think about. One of Bloodborne's biggest weaknesses, you know, despite being released in 2015, the game is ultimately capped at 30 FPS. There have been plenty of games back in the earlier 2000s that managed to maintain a smooth 60 frames even on older hardware, but for the direction this game was taking, it probably probably wasn't feasible to make Bloodborne run at a consistent 60 FPS. This has made tons of people really want a Bloodborne remake or a remaster, and I'm about to say something a little bit controversial. While I wouldn't say no to a Bloodborne remaster if it were offered to me, I, I really don't think it needs one. I think it being at 30 FPS is not only something that kind of makes it feel the way it does, but more importantly, it's part of its identity and fundamentally, the game is built with 30 FPS in mind. It's possible that moving the game to 60 FPS would create all kinds of problems that we couldn't predict. It would greatly depend on how they'd go about doing a remaster for sure, but in any case, Bloodborne Bloodborne's 30 FPS doesn't detract from the overall game experience one bit in my eyes. But you know, even in the face of all that, there's still a lot of talk about a Bloodborne remaster, or hell, some people have literally just taken the liberty themselves and are recreating the whole game in Unreal Engine, but I don't know, part of me thinks that a Bloodborne remaster really isn't necessary. The game is the experience that it is for a very deliberate reason, and it's a one-of-a-kind experience. And to figure out why that is, we're gonna dig into every part that makes it unique. It's level design, story and world, and of course, it's bosses. Once again, I'm not going to speak on every single boss in Bloodborne, there's just some where they're a little repetitive or I just don't have that much to say about them, but I am going to talk about each main boss plus a few others in detail in their own dedicated sections later on in the video, and yes, that includes all the DLC bosses as well. Anyways, Bloodborne has some outstanding qualities that make me personally feel that it's at least definitely a strong contender for, you know, a few of the best games of all time, however, despite my obvious love and passion for it, I will admit there are a few painful oversights and some rough holes in the experience overall. While these mistakes and oversights don't outright ruin Bloodborne as a whole package by any means, it, you know, it's, in hindsight, it's easy to see where parts of it didn't age so well in a couple areas. Okay, so what does Bloodborne do besides having the hardest fits in all of gaming? I mean, of course, not only do you have the coldest fits known to mankind, but the world lends itself to being appropriate for the attire at first. This time, we're going to start by talking about the story in the world to give you a frame that everything else hangs on. As opposed to something like Elden Ring or, to a lesser extent, maybe even Dark Souls, Bloodborne's narrative and story is conveyed a little more straightforwardly compared to those games. Yes, Bloodborne has a ton of ambiguous elements, but it follows a much more traditional story structure for the most part. In Bloodborne, you begin in a town called Yarnum. The city's plagued by a mysterious and deadly disease known as the Beast Plague, and you begin by doing some kind of blood transfusion, and then you wake up as a hunter who is tasked with investigating the source of the plague and putting an end to it. But while the game appears to be relatively straightforward at first, you know, investigating and defeating beasts in this old Victorian, like, gothic-style town, this is only the surface. The first couple hours of the game are merely the tip of the iceberg as to what's really happening. As you chew through Old Yarnum, you learned that a scourge of 
of the beast that turns people into these creatures is a result of blood that's been infected. The blood came from the healing church, and that church used this blood to cure every ailment and sickness. Naturally, you know, this made people thirsty for it, and eventually, each person would be overcome by what was called the scourge of the beast. Hunters were initially dispatched by the church to deal with these beasts and to keep the streets safe and clean, but eventually it became too much, and Old Yarnum was eventually sanctioned off to try and stop the spread. Because this initially takes place in a city environment, the streets are narrow, and the game's puzzles are meant to be experienced in a very particular way. However, this is where one of my biggest gripes with Bloodborne come into play. In the early game of Bloodborne, coming across blood vials for healing or silver bullets are pretty scarce to do so. This is practically your fuel for progression and chewing through the level design. This problem does get alleviated later on, which we'll talk about, but the first couple of areas are kind of rough for this. So this is a big problem because it directly affects how it's related to combat. But let me explain this. The key difference with Bloodborne compared to many other FromSoft titles, when you go back to the Hunter's Dream or, you know, what's basically your safe space, or you just go back to the Lantern or Bonfire or Grace or whatever you want to call it, you're generally refilled on all of your resources. Bloodborne does not refill these things. Instead, you got to farm them from enemies in the world or you got to purchase them from the Hunter's Dream. And I think that this can really destroy the gameplay pace and momentum that Bloodborne's trying to have. I mean, Bloodborne's got a certain energy and in, in just pacing that the game does so well to establish, and the vial and bullet farming is a giant contradiction to that in its mechanics. And that leads me into combat. I absolutely love Bloodborne's combat. It's one of the most like saucy and intricate and just fun to engage with combat systems ever. Let me explain what I think makes the combat so good and why this emphasis on farming resources really hurts it. Okay, so the key components that set Bloodborne's gameplay apart from the others is mostly its gun slash parrying mechanic, quick stepping, which is a dodge alternative or counterpart, weapon transforming, and rallying. The gun in your left hand in most cases is not meant to be a damage weapon at all, unless you're using the Evelyn or, you know, a couple different other ones, but for the most part, this is a tool that if you catch the enemy in the startup of a move, you can parry them and land a massive punish. Enemies in Bloodborne are very aggressive and throw out tons of moves and this allows you to break combos punish and get some of your own combos started and once again i love this mechanic but the silver bullets you fire are a limited resource so if you run out you don't get replenished even after going to a lantern or the hunter's dream in any automatic way you must farm them or purchase them from a shop it just doesn't feel like you get rewarded for playing well resource wise you know yes there's a mechanic to use some of your hp to get temporary bullets and it certainly helps but it doesn't seem to quite cut it in my opinion and i know literally nobody asked and i'm eight years too late plus self-ratio but if bloodborne were to get a remaster i think an excellent quality of life improvement would be if you kill an enemy off a parry punish you should get that one bullet back a small change, but I think it re would reward efficiency and precision timing even more. This would keep the pace up without breaking the core gameplay loop and making bullets too easy or unlimited, and it would just save a lot of the ball ache that comes with farming stuff. Basically, what I'm saying here is I hate how a fundamental combat mechanic is a resource that doesn't get renewed in this game. Next is the quick stepping mechanic, and Bloodborne's all about being fast paced and aggressive. You are the hunter in this case, and this is partly achieved by the in increased speed of the player. Of course you can roll, but there's a time and place for both and it's a little more situational. Now again, for the most part, I love this mechanic as well, but it's not without its issues either. One of the things I love that Elden Ring did is they separated the jump function onto a different button. It has its own input there. To jump in Bloodborne, you need to roll out of a sprint. Sure, this is kind of cool for like parkour spots or whatever, but it's a complete pain in the ass in combat when you're trying to sprint and roll away or under a move and you get your jump caught since it's not invulnerable. It's extremely annoying. If I want to jump, I'll, I'll input a jump, you know? Having them on the same button is a terrible idea. But that's really my only issue with the movement, otherwise I love everything about it. Bloodborne also has weapon transformations that are baked into its fundamental combat too. For example, the saw can be swung in its short form, and this is faster and has much less end lag, but doesn't have as long of a hitbox. You can transform this into the long saw where it's slower, it hits a bit harder, and has better reach, but it has much more startup time and end lag. The cool part is you can use transform attacks mid-string to extend your combo 
bow or get some other kind of desired outcome. It goes such a long way in giving you some real agency about how you deal with encounters and enemies. Every weapon in the game has, you know, different transform options, and it adds so much to the core combat loop. I, I have nothing negative to say about the system, and I genuinely love it. I'd love to see this return in some kind of future FromSoft title. And finally, perhaps the defining feature of Bloodborne itself is health rallying. So essentially, after taking damage, you have a few seconds to hit the enemy back and salvage some of that potentially lost HP. This encourages you to be on the offensive much more often, but more importantly, this requires requires you to completely change your approach to your flow of combat. In Dark Souls or Elden Ring, typically in an engagement with a boss, if you take damage, your first reaction is to roll or run away, preventing you from getting hit again and getting to a safe distance or out of its threat range, escaping disadvantage and resetting neutral. But in Bloodborne, to escape disadvantage, part of it is swinging more. I mean, you can't just mash buttons and be invincible, but there's a certain change in mindset you need to prioritize attacking the boss right back before you go resetting neutral. Attacks usually hit for quite a lot of damage, but it works in this game because you can always salvage at least some, if not all, of that lost health. Some bosses, you gotta be up in their faces at all times, and some you can get away with being a little more passive. This means there's a good variety in combat flow, which you'll see when we get to bosses. It can be a great thing and a terrible thing. I didn't seem to really do much. By the way, <clears throat> go follow me on Twitch. My dearest internet chatroom viewer, if thou art moved by the contents of my YouTube channel and enjoy partaking in a bit of virtual tomfoolery, then I implore thee to subscribe forthwith and not tarry in this matter. So what sayest thou? Wilt thou now subscribe forthwith and partake of the bountiful entertainment that my channel doth offer? A corpse should be left well alone. Okay, so we've gone over the combat and, you know, how the player kind of engages with the world, but let's talk about the areas and levels themselves. Like I said, thematically, the game gets more and more twisted and f***ed up as you go deeper into it. But what's so cool about it is that it parallels its themes of, you know, exploration and digging deeper and seeing things that you previously couldn't comprehend before and so on in its literal level design and story. As far as narrative goes, as you progress, you learn that there's so much more than just this infected blood situation. It all came from great ones. Humankind sought to ascend their being to a higher plane of existence in all types of ways. There's so much Lovecraftian influence smeared all over the, you know, lore and just overall story of the game, and the influence of the great ones is ultimately why you're in the nightmare. It's more complicated than that, but the idea is reflected in its literal level design too. So typically in any area there's going to be just a few lanterns and usually you need to go quite far and cut through really dangerous territory to reach the boss of that area and this can present a real problem because remember resources are non-renewable and the long routing to a boss can cause you to burn resources that you just can't afford to lose for it so instead by exploring with a careful enough eye you'll find a bunch of like useful elevators or lifts for all my uk lads and these allow you to bypass many dangerous areas that you really don't want to tread through again. Bloodborne's level design is really big on finding hidden shortcuts. I mean, like, there's literally shortcuts that take you to other shortcuts. But while the levels at their core, you know, comparatively speaking, are fairly linear, they really reward you for paying attention, opening doors to connect other areas. Bloodborne's world starts to make sense when you realize how interconnected it all is. Like, some really interesting ones, like how the back end of the Wailing Woods, it connects to the starting areas at Yosefka's clinic. All the nightmare areas, etc., and how they kind of intertwine, it allows you to map the relative scale of the world in your mind, especially when you realize how extensive the two main Yarnum areas are. What's even crazier is that throughout your journey, you'll collect these things called insight, and in certain areas of the game, having a certain number of insight will allow you to see things and beings that were always there, but outside of your comprehension until you had enough insight to see them. This is not only insane from a storytelling and narrative perspective, but it changes the gameplay in tangible ways as well. The, for example, certain enemies can appear to you in, you know, areas you've never seen before, and if you're below a certain threshold, some enemies won't be visible or dangerous to you at all. 
well you can absolutely blow through areas and just beeline it to the bosses the levels really reward you for exploring dangerous areas and taking your time on stuff and even going in places that you maybe shouldn't try not only are there a plethora of areas with all different aesthetic and visual styles, but there's also a bunch of secret areas that can be accessed too, either by acquiring like certain items or doing side quests, etc. But these take you to some of the most unique and amazing looking levels ever. Kanehurst Castle is a real standout to me. To even get there at all, you have to do this kind of weird secret quest where like this, you know, carriage comes and picks you up and then it drops you off at this random location. But Kanehurst Castle has all the hallmarks of a great Bloodborne area. Plenty of puzzles, shortcuts, great enemies, and a boss fight, and a secret area within a secret area. Its atmosphere is also just so damn haunting. This goes for every area in the game. The environment and tone is like the most like hopeless, depressing, nihilistic, and like doomer feeling world you've ever experienced. And it gets even more pronounced as you go deeper and encounter the more cosmic horror aspects to the game as well. As much as I love both Dark Souls and Elden Ring, in my opinion, Bloodborne has the most carved out and crafted tone, uh, a vibe, and art style of just about any FromSoft game, period. Now, there are some areas in the game that are visually really amazing, like Yahar Ghoul, but this area kind of sucks in a way because it's really hard to explore and really absorb the environment because of the dense and thick amount of enemies packed into this space. This area is great to look at, don't get me wrong, but it's not so great for interacting with the environment for its gameplay as compared to some other areas of the game. A lot of the levels have this problem to a degree, but in general, the level design is really meticulous, smart, and precise in terms of how you should feel or how you should go about engaging with it and traversing the level itself. You'll notice within these as well, not only are there a variety of shortcuts and different paths if you're exploring properly, but these detours can help you find rare items or take you to other optional like secret bosses or just otherwise reward you or punish you for being curious. On secret path, Pog, you're right. What is going on? <laughs> what just happened? So I want to quickly look at how player progression works in Bloodborne as well and how you go about getting more powerful throughout your journey. The currency that you use, you know, the souls or runes or in this game are called blood echoes and your primary use for these blood echoes, besides just leveling up, will be to purchase all kinds of items but blood vials and silver bullets primarily. And in the early game, it's an absolute chore. Like I said earlier, this is really one of my only major gripes and issues that I have with Bloodborne. It gets alleviated in the mid to late game for sure where it pretty much becomes a total non-issue but for a while in the beginning this was really chapping me also within the hunter's dream you can equip blood gems on your weapon and then runes on your character i'll start with blood gems and i describe this system as being slightly more straightforward and streamlined compared to dark souls upgrading you know for your particular weapon but it's a bit more convoluted and clunky than elden ring's ashes of war system not only is the ui for this not great but it's not super clear as to what you know gems affect what stats and attributes and scaling and how it relates to your weapon this could have been done a little better for sure but it's by no means terrible also you have runes that you can collect on your journey and this is much more easily telegraphed to the player and they're a lot more straightforward and they make a bit more sense but these two systems in combination allow you to really tune your gameplay for the situation at hand even if you're running relatively the same build and I really enjoy these systems in combination. I think they're great. However, Bloodborne also has weapon durability, and this causes your weapon to get weaker and weaker with each use until it's fully repaired. My main problem with this is it just doesn't serve any function or need to be in the game at all. It boils down to being a minor inconvenience and another entry on a list of chores to take care of every time you're back at the Hunter's Dream. It barely costs anything. At best, it's a waste of time. At worst, it's borderline terrible game design once again I, I know literally no one asked and I'm eight years too late but I think an easy fix to this without throwing away the system entirely once you've upgraded your weapon to plus 10 you know the max level durability from that point on should stay at max forever you've kind of earned it and now you don't have to waste your time on chores like I, I don't know I just don't really see any actual point to that system but it doesn't ruin any part of the game like I said it's a minor inconvenience
It's like, have you ever been just about to leave your house and you've turned off all the lights, but as you're walking out the door, you notice that like your bathroom light is still on in your bedroom. And for a second, you kind of think to yourself and you wonder if you could even be bothered to take the time. That's kind of how I feel about the pointless durability mechanic. Also, another thing you're going to notice about Bloodborne's levels is there's no dungeon crawling at all. Like, there's no dungeons even integrated within them. Bloodborne has chalice dungeons, but th I don't think these are quite implemented as well as they could have been. Many of the chalice dungeons are just a bit bloated. They've got, like, absurd rule sets just to make sure it takes you longer, or they're just a bit monotonous or, or and, and kind of boring. I feel like these could have been a bit more short and concise and implemented in the regular levels, because as they are, they feel like a really tacked-on feature that was just too half-baked to be healthily put into the real, you know, game design. The feature was a great idea, but it feels just a little disconnected from what the rest of Bloodborne is doing in my opinion. Now, before we get to bosses, I want to quickly discuss Bloodborne's approach to side quests and other optional content. I criticize Elden Ring side quests because with how arbitrary and ambiguous they could be, and the sheer scale of the world made them so much more tedious than really they needed to be. Bloodborne doesn't have this problem so much at all. Because the scale of the world is much more intimate, side quests for characters or other items can be done, you know, fairly quickly without any of them feeling super tedious. And this can lead you to, you know, getting extra blood gems or armor or just other items that will prove useful on your journey. However, a lot of items use cases can depend greatly on the build and also your character's attributes. Like for example, there's certainly a few more like magic oriented builds and weapons that you can play if you want to spec into that, but the real problem with magic based builds in Bloodborne is like casting spells pulls from your bullets since there's no other resource bar for it. So if you're trying to parry and using magic, it's virtually impossible to do both effectively. Just like other FromSoft games, when creating your character, you get choices to, you know, make your base stats. This includes comments about your upbringing and how you were raised. This determines what stats you're more suited for and what areas you're lacking in. Or you can just go pick the low tier god option and go with the waste of skin. Your life is nothing. You serve zero purpose. You should kill yourself now. <laughs> Bloodborne's core gameplay and world does such a good job at instilling this overwhelming feeling of dread within you. This is accomplished by, again, the level design and how brutal the world can be, the visuals as we just discussed, thematically the game getting increasingly twisted beyond what was thought to be possible on the cosmic horror scale, but let's not forget, the main reason FromSoft games, and Bloodborne in particular, really fills its players with dread is the main bosses. But before we jump straight into them, I noticed that Bloodborne has a blend of really amazing and borderline perfect bosses and some completely sauceless and garbage tier boss fights as well. Mostly in the base game, uh, the DLC has excellent bosses for the most part and we're going to discuss them all and what makes them great or in some other cases not so great. So the first real roadblock you're going to encounter in Bloodborne is Papa G or Father Gascoigne. Now, of course, you can fight the Cleric Beast beforehand, but that's not a mandatory boss. Father G, you absolutely do need to face, and I think this fight is absolutely beyond excellent. It's one of the best fights, I think, in FromSoft's entire history. And in the context of Bloodborne, it's one of the best fights as it's sort of a tutorial for the rest of the boss offering in the game. So in the first phase, you know, you kind of learn how to fight these more humanoid 1v1 style characters. And then when he, you know, turns into the beast in his technically third phase, you learn how to fight the beast pace as well. Like you kind of learn how to deal with those too. So it's an excellent like sort of tutorial for how the rest of Bloodborne Bloodborne plays, but each phase in and of itself has also excellent moves and everything is very well telegraphed to the player. Your first ever encounter with him, it may feel impossible because Father Gascoigne just throws out tons of moves and he's unbelievably aggressive, and so this may cause you to play a bit more passive, but this is definitely the wrong approach with him because he punishes more passive play. As you get more comfortable with Father Gascoigne, especially in his first and second phase, you learn to implement the parry mechanic a lot more because a lot of his moves have these long windups that are extremely punishable. Way less punishable in the beast phase, although you definitely can do that as well, but you learn how to 
interact with the most basic fundamental mechanics of boss fights per se in Bloodborne, and Father G is just such a good way to show that to the player. I love this fight so much, it's great to have it as the first main boss, and I don't think they could have done it any better. Also, not to mention, because even though Father G is very aggressive, this fight awards you for being super aggressive as well, and so using your transform attacks and implementing those can give you tons of combo extensions for even more damage. So it's just an outright great blueprint, I think, for how the rest of Bloodborne's bosses play. They literally could not have done this any more optimally. Next up is Vicar Amelia, which is your second mandatory boss, and I would say your first real encounter with a beast boss fight. Yeah, again, there's Cleric Beast, and then there's Blood Starved Beast too, and these have similar properties, but Vicar Amelia is really the one that takes the beast archetype to the, you know, maximum level, and I think Vicar Amelia can definitely give people a lot of trouble, because you have to approach it very differently than you did with Father Gascoigne, or at least in his first and second phase. The thing with Vicar Amelia is, like, these beast fights, you have to play a little bit slower and just weave in and out of its threat range and really only punish when it's safe to do so but also you learn to employ other things like potentially fire on your weapon or molotovs or you know fire elements can significantly damage these beasts more than your typical you know standard melee weapon although it does do damage it can be heavily bolstered by some of these other things vicar Amelia's attacks do a ton of damage but they are slow and fairly easy to react to as long as you're pacing yourself it really isn't too difficult what really is the key difference between, again, these more humanoid 1v1 style fights and then beast fights is you really can't parry beasts, right? That that mechanic is almost totally nullified. You can get knockdowns and stuff by breaking their poison and whatnot, but for the most part, the parry mechanic you should just put away and not think about for these fights because it's not really going to serve you any real function. You might get like a couple of damage in here and there, but in general, it's just not worth it. Vicar Amelia is fine. Definitely not my favorite kind of fight, but again, I think it's necessary to have these two vastly different styles in the early game so you can kind of get the player familiar and comfortable with different methods of play. So I want to quickly talk about the Witches of Hemwick fight. This is definitely optional. This is not mandatory at all. But if you go into this one, you're going to notice the first time around, hey, there's these witches that, you know, kind of don't really hurt me. And they seem pretty harmless, but there's like these entities walking around that I got to look out for. But once you kill the first witch, you realize that she spawns in a second one and they can heal each other. So at first, this might confuse you your first time around if you don't know what to do. And like, it just seems like they don't die. But the reality is you need to kill them within a certain certain time frame like that's literally the whole gimmick but I think that once you learn this this fight is just like really boring and I don't love the gimmick it's just so funny to me because Bloodborne's like, yo, we got two styles. We have really intricate and masterful, like, mechanical masterpieces of fights. And then we have just these random-ass gimmicks. And so, the Witches of Hemwick is the first one where you're like, hmm, some, th these boss fights are going to be up to something later on. Which, you know, it definitely gets way worse. But, not a great fight, but it's just, you know, one of those little gimmick ones and it's fine or whatever. But, that brings us to the next mandatory boss, the Shadows of Yarnum. And this fight, I absolutely love. This is your first encounter against three different enemies at once and again while at first this may feel impossible it's very very doable once you understand how each one works because they have very different properties to each shadow one is more melee based one kind of does melee plus magic and the other one is very passive just using magic and so they also have good behavior and that means like they go into more passive states as the other one is being more aggressive yeah they both can throw out moves at the same time but they're not all as magic maximum aggressive as they could be because otherwise that would be totally unfair so it's super well balanced and once you get the feel and the threat range for each shadow individually you can take them out one by one and, and deal with them they also have like kind of second phase switch ups too so that this fight isn't monotonous throughout the entire process this fight is great man my only issue is not even with the fight itself it's the fact that they reuse these bosses as normal enemies later in the game like they're so damn cool and intimidating in this first encounter the first time you ever see them but when you you know encounter them later in the game and just like uh, as being a normal boss uh, it's like a normal enemy it's like ah oh, whatever you know it doesn't kind of slap as hard but this boss fight man is excellent you might say it's a little bit gimmicky in some of their second phases and that's totally understandable but this fight for a first time encounter is just unbelievable 
I also want to point out that just with Father Gascoigne, once again, using weapon transforming to extend your combo is very advantageous here because typically when you hit some of these shadows once or twice, they're going to dodge backwards. But if you extend that hitbox as they do, you can keep putting damage on and you get rewarded for it like exponentially. It's such a smartly crafted fight and I just really enjoy this one every time I go and play it. But it can't all be sunshine and rainbows throughout the whole game. You know, you go from this mechanically excellent fight of Shadows of Yarnum off this really high high directly into your next boss, which is Rom, the vacuous spider. And this is a contender for probably one of the worst fights in the game, period. I I, I, I don't even think that's arguable, but I can already hear lore nerds typing, yo, yo, Rom is, is just a, 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 a scrub student, you know what I mean? Like, it's a kind of a bad fight for, I don't care. I don't care if there's a lore explanation why this fight sucks it's a cop-out and it's not a good excuse for bad gameplay believe me i understand the story reason for why this fight is boring but it's no excuse for a mandatory boss to be as dull and just sauceless as it is this fight in the first phase you can literally stand there forever and you will never die the boss is not aggressive whatsoever even these spiders that it spawns will never approach they will never push buttons you have to just go in get a hit every every now and again and then bail like it's so slow you got to grind through it it's just really a test of your patience rather than skill it's just it's not good man and it doesn't utilize any mechanics that make bloodborne unique there's no use of parrying there's none of that like fast paced gameplay that bloodborne's really trying to accomplish it feels like rom was built for a completely different game than bloodborne and they just slapped this into here does not gel well with its systems and just runs completely contradictory to what it's going for now i don't completely outright hate the fight there are a couple redeeming qualities but really it's like the elden beast fight if elden beast were even more boring like it's the same archetype it man even the arenas kind of look the same but this enemy is like you know you go in you get two hits you leave like i i i get the approach to make fights not feel the same as one another and you know totally fair enough but why make fights that are so far the other direction that it runs totally contradictory to all the systems that have been previously established i just don't get it a lot of the base game bosses are like that it's less problematic in the dlc but i just don't understand it and this fight was like probably it's at least bottom three for me in this game it's not good and you know continuing that trend and speaking of not good we have the one reborn which is your next main boss in yahar ghoul now again visually this fight is incredible like the the reveal of this fight is crazy and you know visually super stunning but it's like it this always happens where you have a great looking boss and a really unique set piece but the boss like the boss itself mechanically is so unbelievably dull I think the problem with the one reborn is like it looks way more threatening than it really is and again thematically or lore wise that's probably intentional the idea is that like this is like a big thing where it's they're trying to recreate a great one using human body parts so of course it's not going to be super powerful or it's going to have problems whatever like I get that but that still really is an excuse for the boss fight to not be engaging in its own right this is pretty much one giant sponge that you know will deal occasional damage to you if you're close enough but not really like you, you you go in and you just smack it until the health bar reaches zero there's no really like reactable moves or anything there's nothing you kind of have to learn about this I didn't know anything about this fight the first time I ever played it and you just go in and one and done it for the most part it's very very brainless I think that's the best way to put it and again I love looking at it like just the fight looks amazing but there's no substance behind it there's nothing to this fight Fight when you really look under the hood and that's my main issue with it it's fun to do but it's just like the, the point in the game where it's like okay they're kind of phoning it in right now the best fights are yet to come but this one is it's not outright offensive but it's still pretty low tier for me Next boss I want to talk about is Martyr Ligarius. Now, this is an optional boss in, like I said, that secret area of Kanehurst Castle. And it's really sad because I actually think this would have been a better main boss than a lot of the ones, you know, typically in Bloodborne. Ligarius is great, man, because he exemplifies everything that's interesting about its combat, but adds a little more to it. The only thing I don't really like is this kind of, like, gimmicky sword move that sort of just floats around and deals damage to you. That's, like, a minor annoyance, but it doesn't outright break the fight. He has very parryable moves if you're paying attention. He deals damage, but he isn't super aggressive. So you have to learn the timing on, on everything and really get that down. I love this fight, man. I think it's great. It's definitely high tier for me. It's just a shame. I feel like this could have been a main boss and substitute, you know, something like Rom or the, the, the one reborn for this one. I think it's a lot of fun. 
Also, not to mention it's sick that after you kill Marta Ligaris, you put on his crown, and then a secret area opens up to you in that secret area. It's like, it's hella dope, man. It's a great fight, but it is optional, and a lot of people probably haven't played it. Another optional fight I want to talk about is Amygdala. So, this is like, you know, the big Lovecraftian monster thing that you're going to encounter eventually in the game once you've got enough insight, and they look absolutely wild at first and probably will kill you, but in the boss fight itself, I just don't think that these are very well designed, and my main issue is that it's not clear number one how you're supposed to fight them and when you are fighting them for the most part the enemy is so big you can't really see what it's doing 90% of the time the way this fight was intended is you're supposed to hit amygdala's arms but that's also a lot more in its threat range and you're going to trade hits very frequently as well if you want to deal more damage you got to hit its arms but you know typically this might encourage you to go for the legs because it's a bit harder for amygdala to hit you yeah it can do these stomp moves or whatever or jump in the air and come back down but these are easily avoidable and definitely reactable but if you take the safer option and kind of wait under it then you even if you're fighting its arms for the most part you can't even really see what it's doing the scale of the enemy is so big it just doesn't make for a good fight again visuals excellent really unique looking but mechanically it's it's kind of stupid man like it's not good either it's not horrible don't get me wrong i'd say this is a very middle of the road fight all things considered and you know there are different versions of it inside the chalice dungeons or whatever but for the most part amygdala is not a great fight Certainly not a standout, and I think it's very forgettable besides its unique look. Now, let's talk about the next mandatory boss, Mikolash, host of the Nightmare. And I actually have a lot to say about this fight, because this is touted as one of the most annoying fights in the game. And I agree to an extent, but I think the actual combat of this is pretty good. So, the gimmick is like first time around you walk into this hallway and you essentially got to pin him into this one room otherwise he'll run around the halls infinitely as you chase him down it's very annoying it's kind of slow paced uh if you don't really know what's going on it's like it's a cool gimmick to do it one time but after you've done this once it gets really really old once you've got him in the combat rooms themselves in his first phase he can literally only do one move he has one move and that's it. And then there's like other enemies that, you know, can provide some kind of distraction. But once you take care of them, he has one move and that's it. When you get him in his second phase, you have to do the same gimmick again. You know, pin him into another, you know, room where he can't escape. And then in this phase, he has a couple more. He can do the one uh, tentacle move from his first phase. And then he can do these giant star magic move that is actually pretty devastating and you really can't outspace. And then he can also like hit you occasionally with his fist but that's all you really have to deal with not a super intricate fight but it's pretty difficult the combat scenarios in the first and second phase they're not like standout or anything but they're fun like I, I actually like fighting him in these two different encounters here throughout the boss fight the thing I don't like is the gimmick right again you chase him down the halls funny haha you got me on the joke lol but once you do that once it's like can we just get to the point it makes runbacks an absolute nightmare and again it's really a test of your mental patience not really like testing any kind of skill at all it's literally the prerequisite to get him into the fight to begin with i i think this fight could be a lot more alleviated if you know once you do the gimmick once on subsequent runbacks you kind of just get straight to the point i think that would really help the pace it'd be far less annoying and i get why people kind of hate this boss i think the combat in the first and second phase are actually okay once you get him there like that part's all right not crazy but it's good but the gimmick is just truly not it so getting into our late game bosses or pretty much some of the end game ones, this is going to be Murgo's Wet Nurse. And in general, I think this fight is excellent. It's pretty high tier for me. It's not perfect and it's not the best, but it, I, I love the introduction of this. It's a literal great one that you, with sort of like a, a faceless form. It's just in this black cloak and it has, you know, fairly simple-ish moves. Doesn't mean they're easy moves necessarily, but they're telegraphed. They're easy to react to. They have very, you know, articulate responses about how you should go about dealing with them and it has an interesting special move where it can sort of duplicate itself as it puts fog in the arena and then there could be a second one that's also you know throwing out more moves just a lot more to dodge and deal with it's a lot of fun man this fight's great there's a certain rhythm to this boss fight that you can really find and once you learn how to respond and react to each move that it, i don't know i can't quite put my finger on it why it's so good I, I i think it's excellent and the atmosphere and tone of this fight is super unique that's thanks to the quite unsettling soundtrack it's not you know over the top or bombastic or any or generic in any real sense it's this like quiet lullaby that just 
kind of silently plays in the background. And the boss itself makes no real noises. So the fight is eerily quiet, and it's just so unsettling as you're fighting this, this big, giant, like, faceless cloak. And as opposed to every other boss fight in the game so far, when you kill them, you get the prey slaughtered message, you know, as you are the hunter. But when you kill Murgo's wet nurse, you get the message that says nightmare slain. This is indicating that you managed to kill a literal great one, and it feels distinctly different after this fight, and you'll notice there's actually nothing in the baby crib the whole time, although you can hear crying throughout your entire journey. It's a very good, like, wrap-up to the fight. It's not the final boss in the game, but it leads you to the final boss and triggers the end game. This takes us to the base game's final boss, Garamond the First Hunter, and then Moon Presence, but I don't have that much to say about Moon Presence, to be honest, so we'll focus on Garamond for now. This fight, I think, is also super super high tier, if not top tier. I think it's very much like Father Gascoigne mechanically, where it feels like everything that you've learned up to this point is being tested, and it's a slightly more fast-paced and brutal version of the Father G fight. You have to get the timing down and learn when is appropriate to roll into German's moves and quick step into them rather than away, because if you play too passively and roll away too much, you're just going to get hard punished for it, and so this gives you a really good blend of like passive and aggressive gameplay, gives you opportunities for combo extensions, and takes really every use in Bloodborne and every mechanical advantage to its you know maximum degree. Everything gets tested here. It's good as well because German himself was of course the first hunter, so his playstyle is going to mimic yours quite frequently so typically if you go in for a too aggressive punish he's going to quick step away and put you in a really bad spot he plays almost like a mirror version of yourself and i think this makes for an excellent final encounter of course, if you do a certain ending, you have the Moon Presence fight, but I, again, I don't have much to say about this. It's, you know, really just for story reasons. It doesn't have much mechanics to talk about, but German is a great fight at the end, and I think it was an excellent way to wrap up the base game. We, you know, to be honest, like, all things considered, Bloodborne doesn't have the strongest offering of bosses in its base game. You know, it's got some, like, borderline perfect ones like Papa G and, and German, for sure, but it's got some terrible bottom-tier stuff like Rom or Celestial Emissary. In the base game, there's a bunch of other like smaller random bosses that I just don't have much to say about. Yes, this does add more variety, but the highlights of what I do think are mechanically great fights have all been covered in the base game. But this problem where, where Bloodborne doesn't have amazing bosses in a lot of ways, it's like they're very all over the place, they're great or they're terrible, this gets very much alleviated in DLC, which we're going to get to. So the first DLC boss we're going to talk about is Ludwig the Holy Blade. What I find interesting about the DLC bosses is that they have a very clear echo and archetype in Elden Ring in particular. So Ludwig the Holy Blades fight is basically the Malekith archetype. He starts out as this very fast and aggressive beast that, you know, throws out a lot of moves. He's, he's very in your face and he doesn't really use any weapons. When you get him into his second form, of course, this is when he actually starts using a sword and he starts fighting a little bit more acrobatically or chivalristic or whatever you want to call it. He's a little more like calculated, but so this, this fight clearly heavily inspired Malekith, but this was the first one to do it, and this fight is one of the most beloved in Bloodborne DLC, and I think it's extremely top tier. In his first phase, once again, he's a bit more like primal and animalistic and just throws out a ton of moves, but you're trained to kind of stay in his business still to get the maximum amount of damage. If you run too far away, he will chase you down. So if you stay kind of within his threat range, but just outside of it, that's going to be the best place to be for phase one. For phase two, when he actually gets his Moonlight Greatsword, this is when you need to just kind of space around his actual weapon now. The pace of the fight completely changes once he gets his sword, very similar to how Beast, Clergyman, and Malekith work in Elden Ring. It's very clear they looked at this fight as a general blueprint for that, and I think for good reason, because this fight is just awesome. Yeah, this is actually one of the only Beast fights in the game that I think is quite incredible. It's maybe my favorite one in general, although while it goes, you know, pretty far distance to implement Bloodborne systems, it doesn't quite get there, especially without implementing the parry mechanic and putting an emphasis on that to a degree but other than that i think ludwig is an is it still top tier incredible fight there's really no holes that i can poke in it at all nothing wrong with the first or second phase and it's always a great time to play in the dlc you start out on a really high note with ludwig but it can't always stay that way because now we get to the me boss fight you know they put my likeness in the game we get to living failures 
Fellas, what, what do we think? Is it fair to say that Living Failures is maybe the worst fight in all of Bloodborne? Uh, if it's not the worst, it's undeniably bottom three. And it's by far the worst fight in the DLC offering, that's for sure. But this fight is like, it's very similar to like Celestial Emissary or a bunch of these other like random fights where you just deal damage to like a, a, a thing and then you run away. It's very slow, doesn't implement the systems very well, it's super gimmicky, and it just isn't that fun to play. And in this fight, there's multiple enemies, you know, they don't move very fast, so that's good, but they hit deceptively hard, and so you kind of get hard punished for even getting 1% greedy in a fight that's going to take you, like, at least 10 minutes to finish anyhow. So it's not fun, it's slow, it's dull, it's just not really even worth talking about that much, but I did want to mention it because it's the standout in the DLC for being bad. Everything else in the DLC boss-wise is really good, except this one, but after that, that will bring us to our first, like, real beast boss fight in the DLC besides Ludwig, and this is Lawrence the First Vicar. I think this is the best version of the beast fight done right. It's very similar to Vicar Amelia, even in terms of its location, because it's pretty much in the same spot for the most part, but it's the DLC version of this, and so Lawrence, the big difference with him is his last phase is what really makes him stand out. His first phase is, you know, honestly nothing out of the ordinary, but once you get him in this, like, crawling state, he's very interesting. Like, he kind of has magma worm properties where he can leave fire on the ground. You have to be very careful about getting too close as you'll get burned. Generally speaking, fire does well against beast, but you can't really use that against Lawrence because the, the man is kind of fire. So, like, you, you have to learn to employ different tactics at a different pace. If you're too passive, you'll get wiped out by, like, one or two moves. But if you're just aggressive enough without overdoing it and getting greedy, you can find small openings and, and really deal consistent damage in all of his phases. A lot of people say that he's one of the harder bosses in the DLC, and I totally understand why. As opposed to the other DLC bosses we're going to get to, I think the, th the thing with Lawrence is like, you basically, if you get caught by one or two moves, or if you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, it's pretty much game over. This isn't really like a series of mistakes that leads to your downfall. If you get hit by something once, like, you may as well wrap it up, but I think he's a lot of fun. I think it's my favorite beast fight in the game, and they really have found their footing with that style of it, and so it's a shame that it's only in DLC and none of this, you know, kind of resides in the base game, but it is what it is. Lawrence is a great fight, though. Pretty high tier or maybe average above mid tier for me somewhere around there but this brings us to the last two bosses of the dlc and ones that are in my opinion the highest tier of the game so this takes us to Maria of the Astral Clock Tower, and remember what I was saying earlier about Ludwig, where it's very clear that his design was the blueprint for, you know, a fight like Malekith. I think Maria was basically the blueprint for Melenia in a lot of ways in Elden Ring, because they even have some of the same animations, some of the same properties and such, but uh, basically this fight is maybe one of the best mechanical fights in the game perhaps the best it's arguable but the more i think about it i i actually think this is the best mechanical fight in the game period you know a lot of people say oh maria's too easy once you learn the fight but it's like that's kind of the point that's that's what i'm getting at is like the reason this fight is so good is because once you have it all downloaded and you understand how it works you can go at this anytime you want and it will always be something that that you have down and can understand because you've learned how to respond to each move correctly you know where to be you know what moves are parryable and what's not like once you understand the flow and rhythm it'll take you a while to develop it but once you get it it's kind of like riding a bike you'll never forget and to me that's really the mark of a great boss fight because you know you're relying on what you've learned and that will carry you home it's like this if the only way you lose in this fight is by making a series of mistakes and picking the wrong options in a lot of scenarios it doesn't rely on like a like a, a bullshit gimmick to catch you and make you have a death here and there like if you learn this fight man you'll win and it rewards you for playing well that's how it should be the first phase is simple enough, you know, she relies on fairly aggressive melee attacks that will run you down, and if you can parry and respond to these, you'll get her pretty quickly to her second phase, in which she starts relying on her blood magic, and this is where things get a little bit more tricky. And then when you get her really desperate, she'll start using fire as well as her blood, and this is where it gets the most fun and interesting. This fight is very much like a dance. You need to pick and choose when is the right time to heal, when is the right time to back away, when's the right time to push your advantage and extend combos and be aggressive. It's so good, man. It utilizes everything that makes Bloodborne special. It's probably my favorite fight in the game, maybe besides one or two. It's like definitely top three. And on a good day, Maria is maybe my favorite fight in Bloodborne, period.
I cannot give enough praise to Maria. It's a standout fight mechanically, like I said, but also just thematically, the room is, like, the setting's incredible. The music track slaps in this. Like, everything is on point. It's excellent, and it's precise. And then it's only followed up by the final DLC boss fight in the game, and the most infamous one, this is the Orphan of Kaz. Yes, the man baby himself. And what's so interesting about Kaz is, you know, he's definitely the most difficult boss in Bloodborne, technically speaking. And a lot of people consider him to be one of, if not the hardest boss in any FromSoft game. He's at least a contender for that. But I've spent a lot of time playing with this boss, and I think I figured out why this boss really works, though. So remember earlier I was talking about archetypes and how a lot of Elden Ring's bosses were inspired from these ones. So, you know, again, Malekith's archetype was Ludwig, uh, Melenia is Maria, and interestingly enough, Kaz's archetype is Radagon. They have very similar properties and mechanics, it's just that Kaz is a much more aggressive version of Radagon, but you have to kind of play it the same way, especially in Phase 1. There's a very specific dance and very like deliberate options you have to pick in every scenario in order to keep him at distance or respond to each move. Like You don't want to space too far away from him because his moves are specifically designed to punish punish you, you know, backing away. You kind of have to stay in his face, as dangerous as that is. And believe me, he punishes you for not reacting fast enough in those situations as well. I think his phase one is almost perfect. I love it. Yeah, it's frustrating. It can be annoying, but he has very reactable moves. And if you pick the right option, you do get rewarded for all those things. His second phase, I'm a little bit less, you know, sure on. And there's a couple things that I think are kind of bullshit in phase two. But for the most part, it's still really solid. The only thing I don't like about Kaz as a boss fight is actually the arena. You can walk in the water and you have a lot of space to work with, but that's not telegraphed to the player whatsoever. I think they should have at least showed in his cutscene him walking in the water to maybe give the player an indication of that, but it's not telegraphed to you that you can even walk in that water at all because in Dark Souls, water pretty much always means death. So naturally, you're opposed to that kind of thing. And unfortunately, on the beach section, if you're staying there, you just don't have the space to work with and it really gives cause an advantage if you're constricting your yourself to that minimal amount of space. If you get in the water, it becomes much more manageable and easy, and once you learn the threat range of each move in both phases, it's very, very doable, and it's really rewarding to learn it and get it down. I, I think Kaz is basically a contender for best mechanical boss next to Maria. I don't know which one I necessarily think is better, but they're about equal in my eyes. Besides just his literal mechanics, his presentation is also very special. Uh, we'll, ju we'll just say that, you know, man literally comes out, starts throwing his placenta around, which is, you know, kind of gross, I'm not going to lie, but uh, also his sound design is hella annoying, and so if you're running it back quite frequently, you're probably going to get annoyed at hearing this over and over again. At least Radagon's silent, man. Like, come on. This, it, it, like, I love this fight mechanically, but this definitely drives me crazy. And it's sometimes you kind of just want to turn your sound off and play the game. But anyways, uh, other than that, Kaz is a really good way to bang to end the actual DLC bosses on. And a good capstone to Bloodborne's bosses in particular. The only weak boss in the entire DLC offering is literally Living Failures. You know, kind of brings the average down a little bit. But all things considered, they really optimized these. When you consider Bloodborne in its entirety with DLC included, you realize it's a game that is unbelievably precise and sharp in nailing a tone and identity first and foremost, has unbelievably excellent mechanics, great bosses, super great lore, and when you get to DLC, they didn't stop innovating. They pushed the boundaries with what was thought to be possible with the game's mechanics and boss fights, and the game literally gets visually better as well, so they never stopped pushing boundaries. Bloodborne's a game that has layers upon layers, and that's why I think it's lasted as long as it has. You know, it's not just some random action game that FromSoft put out. This game has had a long lifespan for a very deliberate reason, and it aged like absolute fine wine. Again, I don't even think it necessarily needs a remaster. Well, of course, I wouldn't say no to one if it was just given to me. I, I think this experience is very crystallized for, for a super specific reason, man. Like, this is the experience in the way that it was 
originally intended. And any other version of this would present some kind of deviation from the original formula, whether that would be better or for worse, I don't think any of us can say for sure. But, you know, I, I think Bloodborne, as it is right now in, in the package that stands, this game will kind of last forever. It's one of the games that I think will age the most gracefully as time goes on. And that's what truly makes it a horrifically beautiful game. It's definitely something that's, you know, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. That is completely for sure with Bloodborne. And it will always go down as one of the most legendary video games ever produced.